all of this. Okay, I'm going to need to share my screen here. I'm going to turn off my video just to help with bandwidth. I think you should be able to share now. Here we go. At least we have okay. a, we've got a picture of you. So that's it's a good start, but you probably want to present more than a picture of you. Yeah, here it goes. Yes, you are online, and if you can enlarge your presentation, it would be even better. Yes, perfect. Harold, go okay, ahead. Can you, can, can, you can still hear me. So I am going to talk about how to pay for all of this. We heard some very exciting presentations today about how to change uh, care. Fred started off the day talking about the need to control the growth in healthcare spending. Um, and the challenge is how to do that. Um, there are a lot of bad ways to do it uh, that have been tried in the past. Uh, the typical way is to cut fees to providers to save money or to delay or deny services to patients. Um, those sp spend less money, but they're worse care and poorer access for patients. So value-based care is actually a much better way to do that because it creates a win-win for payers and for patients by lowering spending uh, while giving better care uh, to patients. Um, it does that in many cases by reducing what we often refer to as avoidable spending, things that you can spend less on without harming patients. Um, there's a variety of different opportunities for that. Christina talked about some of them uh, earlier. Obviously, all of the projects have worked on those things in chronic disease and maternity care and cancer treatment and in surgery. Uh, all of those things are, there are things that patients get that are bad for them and bad for payers. The problem is that in getting to that, implementing that, there are barriers in the payment system that make this a win-lose for providers. Win-win for payers and patients, but loss for providers. What are those barriers? There's really two barriers. One is that in many cases, we don't pay or we don't pay enough for the higher value services that will reduce the avoidable spending. So we can keep patients out of the hospital if we do more things for them in the home, over the telephone, through home-based services. We don't often pay for those kinds of things. We don't pay adequately for palliative care, as we heard about in one of the presentations earlier. If you deliver those services, it improves value, but it creates financial losses for the healthcare providers. The second barrier is that that avoidable spending is usually revenue for the providers of healthcare. And they use that revenue to pay for the costs of services. Now, the majority of costs at most healthcare providers will generally be fixed, at least in the short term, whether that's the cost of the hospital or simply the cost of operating the physician practice. So when healthcare providers reduce avoidable services, their variable costs will decrease, but their fixed costs do not, again, at least in the short run. Um, and they may incur additional costs for delivering new higher value services. But their revenues decrease in direct proportion to the reduction in the number of services that they deliver. And that results in financial losses for the healthcare providers. So that's what creates a win-lose for the payers and the providers. When you move to having saving money for the payers, the providers lose money. So if you're going to have a successful value-based payment system, you have to remove those barriers, both of those barriers. Now, what a lot of people have been doing and calling it value-based payment is creating so-called incentives for healthcare providers. The typical approach to this has been to create what are called shared savings models or pay for performance. Under those models, typically there is no change in the underlying fee-for-service payment system. Everybody gets paid the exact same amounts for the same things they got paid for before, and they don't get paid for anything new. Under those models, if the payers save money this year, the providers may get some more dollars next year if they, get, if they qualify for a bonus. But the problem with those systems is that there's no additional payments to actually deliver the high value services in the first year. So how does the provider cover those costs? And second, even if they do qualify for an incentive payment, that incentive payment will generally be less than the added costs that they incur or the losses that they incur to deliver the value-based care. And so you end up again with a win-lose. 
if you're going to have a win-win instead of a win-lose, you have to actually reform the payment system, not just add incentives on top of the existing structure. There are four steps for being able to do that. The first step is to start by identifying those specific areas where there is potentially avoidable spending. It isn't a matter of simply creating a payment model and hoping someone finds a way to reduce spending. You have to know what those are in advance. And all the presenters today have found ways to identify what those opportunities are. The second is to design services that will reduce the avoidable spending. You have to know what you're going to be doing differently in order to reduce that avoidable spending, whether it's care management, coordination, lower cost treatment, prevention and screening. The third step then is to pay adequately to support those higher value services, which is why you have to know what the services are so you can know what it is you need to pay for them. But to make it adequate, you have to know what it's going to cost to deliver the higher value care. And it's not enough to know what your current costs are. A lot of people have been doing time-driven activity-based costing and other kinds of cost accounting systems to tell you what it currently costs. But that doesn't tell you what it will cost to deliver care in a different way. To do that, you have to have a cost model that tells you how cost will change when value-based care is implemented. What will it cost to deliver new high-value services that you haven't delivered before? And how much will the cost of your current services change? How much of that is variable, changes with every unit change in services? How much of it is semi-variable? It only changes if you have a large change in volume. And how much of it is really fixed and can only be changed over a long time horizon? That third step is critical to understand what it will cost so that you can make sure that the payment is adequate. Not too much, not too low. Then the final step is if in fact you're paying adequately for value-based care is to hold providers accountable for the results. If you think that you can reduce avoidable spending by delivering different services, then you should be accountable for actually doing that. Now there's no one right way to structure that. You can use bundled payments, warranty payments, episode payments, condition-based payments, outcome-based payments, et cetera. Um, the challenge is to make sure that it's designed specifically for the kind of care you're trying to deliver and not just assume that because it's bundled, it's better. There are wrong ways to do this. And a lot of value-based payment systems are trying to put physicians or hospitals at financial risk for the total healthcare spending on their patients, including things that those physicians or hospitals don't even control or deliver, things like higher prices of drugs and medical devices. If you're going to have a good accountability system, it has to be focused on what each individual provider can influence. Primary care physicians, general practitioners can't control the cost of cancer treatment, but they can encourage patients to get mammograms and colonoscopies. Oncologists can't prevent cancer, but they can help patients avoid or minimize problems from chemotherapy toxicity and so, and so forth. So each model really has to be con con uh, customized to what the provider can do. If you design a good alternative payment model, it can be a win-win-win. A win for payers with lower spending, a win for patients getting better care and not unnecessary services, and a win for physicians or hospitals getting adequate payment for high value services. One key thing that also has to be done is to recognize that both the necessary and the avoidable services differ among patients. There are lower need, medium need, higher need patients, and the higher need patients often have more avoidable spending, but they also have a need for more of the necessary services. And it doesn't work to simply say we're going to pay the same amount for all patients because the same amount isn't going to be adequate. What we really need are condition-based payments that are adjusted for the differences in patient needs. So we pay more for the patients who have higher needs and we have a different level of accountability associated with that. A lot of people think, well, that's too complicated, and we'll simply do a population-based payment or capitation, and somehow it will all average out. So we can pay the same amount for the high-need patients as the low patients, but it will all average out. The problem is it doesn't average out. When you get more high-need patients, you end up with losses. 
and you end up with a system where you end up making profits if you cherry pick patients, i.e. focus on simply the lower need patients and exclude the higher need patients. If you have a condition-based payment where the payment differs by patient need, then you don't lose money if you serve higher need patients and you don't make profits by cherry picking patients. And so you really want to have a structure that is designed, customized to the patient's individual needs. And if you think about this, fee-for-service payment tends to have problems at the one end. It rewards over-treatment. It doesn't reward under-treatment, though, because you get paid more for delivering more services. Strict population-based capitation systems go in the opposite direction. They reward under-treatment, and they don't reward over-treatment. A condition-based payment is in the middle. It should not reward either over-treatment or under-treatment. Now, a lot of people say, well, how can it possibly be win, win, win if you're cutting spending? Well, the answer is we're not really cutting spending. We're slowing the growth in spending. And as Fred showed early on, it's the trend that we're trying to control. So we don't have to actually cut people, cut positions or cut spending from where it is today. We simply need to reduce the increase. So how do we get there? Well, I think it's critical that both the payment and the care delivery are designed together. The problem we have today is that if you leave payers to design the system themselves, they will design things so that the payers win. They will want to try to achieve the maximum reduction in total spending with the minimum change in payment methods and administrative costs and try to push as much as possible the financial risk from the payer to the provider. Conversely, if you let the providers try to design things, they will design things so that they win. They will want the maximum payment for services, new payments for all new services they deliver, no accountability for outcomes, and no financial risk. If you look at that, what that says is obviously neither of those approaches is going to work. What we need is to have collaboration, collaboration between the payers and providers through some mechanism, a task force or otherwise, to actually try to identify a win-win design, where the savings are based on avoidable spending, where there's adequate payment for the high value services, where the risk that the payer keeps is, on, is, is for things other than what the provider can control, and that the providers are ensuring that they're delivering services in the most efficient, effective ways, and that they're taking accountability for the things that they can take accountability for. So there you have it. There are four steps to designing value-based payments. Start with identifying the opportunities to reduce avoidable spending. They will differ for different patients and in different communities. Second is to design the services that will reduce the avoidable spending. You have to know what you're gonna be able to do differently so that you can design payments to support that. Third, you have to know what that's going to cost and pay adequately for it. And then you have to hold providers accountable for results, for the outcomes that they can control. And to get there, we need a lot more collaboration than we typically do today. Collaboration between payers and providers, cooperations between physicians, hospitals, and other providers. And we need to design things in ways that will keep providers successful, but not, not giving them an appropriate risk. And a critical part of all of this is patience because this takes time to do. You can't expect large savings immediately. People need time to be able to put these things in place. So there, that's a very quick overview. I'll be happy to make these slides available to anyone who wants them. There's a lot more detail you can get in these free publications on our website at www.paymentreform.org, both about what's wrong with a lot of the things that people are doing today, as well as how to create a better model. And with that, I will um, conclude and answer questions if you have them, or so we can simply move on. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Harold. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Harold, for this. Really, I'm really impressed how you can explain such a, a difficult subject in an eloquent and in a simple way. Even myself, as being a head and neck surgeon, I understood what you were saying and it, that's it's actually it's a, it's a compliment. Well, thank you very much that's a that's a high compliment. Yeah thank you so much. Um, the, for anyone who has a question you can also of course look at the sheets in on the website that and, and look at the uh, patientreform.org.
Otherwise, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to send the chat uh, questions through you. Thanks again, Harold, for uh, sharing this uh, with us.